Good evening, Facebook Live and YouTube streaming. Good evening, Facebook. <laughs> Welcome to Wine Cellars Wine Wednesday. Sorry for the delay out there. We have some traffic and rain issues with our guest today. Um, my name is Lee Slussinger, and I am Vice President of Portfolio Management and Wine Education here at Wine Cellars. And today I am wearing my bright yellow short uh, because we're going to take a trip to sunny California. So I was getting in the mood. Um, we're still waiting for our guests, so I'll give a little preamble here. Um, we've been working with Venom Cellars for five or so years, five or six years now. But the two founders, we'll talk to one of them tonight, Richard Bruno, the other Chris Condos, um, are winemakers between the two of them that have years and years and years of experience in many different regions of California. What we're gonna do tonight is focus on the Central Coast and three wines from Venom. Um, the three wines from Venom Cellars that we'll taste are is the Farmhouse Chardonnay, the Farmhouse Pinot Noir, and the Insider Cab um, from Paso Robles. Um, so we're waiting for Richard here. Um, it's apparently not so sunny in California, at least Napa Valley. He is in his office currently and uh, was delayed in getting there due to tremendous rainstorms. So I'm, I'm um, hopeful that it will be sunny there soon and it might be sunny on the central coast. Um, I would like to uh, share a little bit of the screen here. We'll get Richard here shortly and just wanted to share a couple things here and maybe we'll talk about why the farmhouse is called the farmhouse here. Um, which Richard will be joining us shortly from, the Farmhouse, a relatively new label for Venom Cellars. It used to be the V Series, and now we have the Napa Valley Tasting Room on the front cover. Uh, we will taste that Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir and head a little further south down the Central Coast. So here's our farmhouse. And we call it a master class here, but the master class, it's not really going to be a master class. Hopefully we'll get Richard on the line and we will uh, enjoy some anecdotal stories from him and his history and Richard and Chris. So let's see if he has joined us yet. Richard, are you out there? Well, I'm going to do a little presentation for him until he can join us. So here we go. So I'm going to blow this up. And so on the left there, you have Richard Bruno on the right, Chris Condos, and they have a rather unique story. Um, they met at UC Davis 20 odd years ago. And some facts about Richard, I think it's always fun to when we meet somebody, learn a little bit about him. Uh, he was born in New Orleans in 1969 and left because of Hurricane Camille. He grew up in St. Louis and at an early teenage years moved to San Francisco where he was exposed obviously to the wine industry. His father played uh, football for Newt Rockne at Notre Dame and he's also named after his grandfather, George. Uh, fun fact, uh, Richard's Real first name is George, and my real first name is Richard, so we have fun calling each other Richard. I'm going to take a quick peek to see if Richard's joined us here. Richard is still not there. And so we'll continue here. They actually met at University of California in Davis. They were classmates, um, and they... UC Davis, if you're not familiar with UC Davis, it is the preeminent place for viticulture and enology in the United States, uh, globally recognized as top notch. Um, they, Richard likes to talk about the scientific method 
um, which is ex uh, ex controlled experimentation, uh, where winemaking is a balance between the science and the art. Uh, the creative process meets the scientific process. So if there's something that's not quite right or to their liking in the winemaking process, instead of changing everything, they'll change one variable at a time in order to find its effects upon the final wine. So the scientific method applied, which is always good to keep in mind when we're dealing with something that we often talk about as very subjective, uh, very artistic, um, and we talk about the flavor profile, but there is a strong science that goes behind this. So it's the, ba the balance and the blending between science and art. And some of their mentors include Randall Graham from Bonnie Doon, an icon in the industry, Doug Bell from Whole Foods. Um, of course, without a chef, there is no wine. So we have chef here. Um, some more winemakers, Larry Stone, MS extraordinaire, and Pine Ridge, where uh, they had worked, one of them had worked for some period of time and actually fell in love with the variety Chenin Blanc. I'm gonna see if Richard has joined us again uh, so he can tell the more personal story of how he started uh, Venom Cellars. He is getting there. So I will continue with our story moving forward. Insanity or brilliance, you decide. He has a really interesting story, and I don't think this is a story that can be told today, where they finance their own winery on credit cards using custom crush space right at Napa Wine Company in Oakville, where they actually still operate. Um, so they actually financed their business on credit cards, something that uh, sounds as romantic as the wine industry should be. But um, the reality is, is the amount of exposure, financial exposure, and the risk they took here was fantastic. So we talked about Chenin Blanc being kind of the first thing that they, uh, that they kind of fell in love with. And if you're familiar with the white elephant, that was kind of their start. Uh, over 20 years ago. So um, uh, Chenin Blanc is kind of the backbone and a signature variety. Um, and they actually sold their first vintage right out of the trunks of their cars. So they drove around, sold wine literally out of the trunks of their cars. Uh, if anybody's been a wine salesman out there, I often call it a, uh, a like being a uh, traveling salesman or vacuum cleaner salesman. And these guys were literally had the product in their trunk delivering it. So uh, very humble beginnings for them. So Richard should be with us. He'll talk a little bit about the winemaking, the philosophy, um, and some different areas that he's worked in. And let's see if he's with us. Still not with us. All right. We'll keep going. And so some of the winemaking, they don't, they actually do own a vineyard, but most of what they work with is actually contract grapes. So they work with um, growers all across California that they've known from 20 plus experience years working at Venom and even before then. Um, and they have a philosophy is that they like to pick uniformly ripe. They work the skins hard to maximize skin contact for uh, extraction and varietal character. They also like to have responsible use of oak. They don't want to kill the variety or kill the fruit character or kill the natural uh, flavor profile of any particular wine with too much new oak. So you'll see kind of that judicious hand there um, balancing oak flavor with varietal character. Um, they use commercial yeast strains, which are different yeast varieties that are specifically designed for different varieties. You can see some hand sorting here. So all this love and care and attention goes into the wines that he makes. Um, sustainability is another backbone uh, that these guys like to work with. A lot of the growers are certified sustainable. Um, glycosophate is Roundup, so they're not using Roundup 
A lot of the vineyards that they work with, they've worked with for 20 years and are actually grown uh, organically, managed organically, but not certified. Um, the certification process is uh, costly, number one, and time consuming, number two. So a lot of the growers just operate organically without needing the certification. And then for further sustainability, they use domestic glass labels and cartons. Uh, the corks and capsules still come from Spain and Portugal. Um, hard to replicate that here. Um, but where possible, we're lowering our carbon footprint by use of domestic glass labels and cartons. Um, I think now might be a good time to, oh, we can meet Richard and his family. It's a family affair too. And before we go here, uh, let's taste some Chardonnay and pop back out and see if Richard has joined us. Richard is with us. So let's add him to the stream here. Richard. Hey. How you doing, buddy? Sorry. Uh, I guess I'm an Apple user and I don't have Google Chrome. And uh, so then I thought it best to um, rinse, repeat, and sterilize myself before entering the meeting. So sorry for that uh, COVID-19 uh, lengthy preparation. Apologies. <laughs> Thank you for joining us. Uh, apparently it's not terribly sunny there, which is part of our delay here. We'll say again, I'm sorry. Uh, apparently, it's not terribly sunny there. You have some no, no. Downfall. It's it's actually raining cats and dogs last couple of days. A bit of a surprise to to most of us. Um, and you know, we're up here on the north coast in Napa, and I know that today's talk uh, centers around the central coast. And I've been in touch with friends in the Paso Robles area, and at least yesterday they didn't get a drop of rain. I saw a lot of rain clouds, but not uh, not any precipitation at least yesterday. So us getting this weather um, is uh, focused more on the north, north coast, I guess, and uh, kind of slowed me down a little bit today. Caught some Bay Area traffic on the way to the warehouse, so. Understood, anyway. totally acceptable. So, Hopefully I filled in sufficiently for no, you. No, I, I was listening along. It sounded pretty good to me. Um, okay. If you want to do the rest of this, you're welcome. <laughs> well, <laughs> I was doing it. I was prepared to do it. Thank you for joining us because it gives me a break so that we can taste a little Chardonnay. Yeah, so that sounds great. Let's taste a little great. Chardonnay. I've, I've got the uh, farmhouse and I described kind of where we've moved to in terms of label awesome. and kind of some branding there. So Excellent, excellent. Um, why don't you tell so, us a little bit about how we changed and what the philosophy is? Well, so first of all, the wine is, um, is the same as it's been since I think 2008 or nine when we first started making Chardonnay. Same vineyard sources, same vineyard manager, same properties. Um, but in searching for a label that best identifies who we are, we decided to focus it on our uh, our building, which is an 1880s farmhouse, which you see depicted on the label. And I'm standing here uh, at this location now in what will be our tasting room. And uh, we're pretty excited about that. And so finally, I feel like we um, are able to sort of iconize our brand a little bit. We've always been um, you know, kind of a, a small lean company of two guys that are making wine on a shoestring budget. Um, I think earlier you most probably uh, talked about that we financed the company on credit cards, which is a true story. Um, we still sort of run our company in a lean way uh, today. Um, I'm sort of, you know, not addressing the Chardonnay immediately here, but I, I kind of wanted to give you a sense of of where we are in time and place and what's going on. But, you know, these cabinets behind me um, were actually reclaimed from Napa Wine Company where we make our wine in Napa. And so they did a remodel on their tasting room and kicked out a bunch of uh, cabinets that they offered to us. And so uh, we were able to take advantage of that opportunity and, um, you know, helps us with the budget so that we don't have to um, pay somebody to build new cabinets. And uh, this is going to be um, the core of our tasting room at some point. So we've always been really thrifty, uh, take advantage of opportunities, but the focus has always been on quality of wine, getting the best grapes we can and putting the quality into the actual uh, wines that we're producing. And that's very true about Chardonnay. Uh, Chris and I, my business partner, who's also uh, one of our winemakers, 
um, we've, we've, it's a variety that we haven't, um, you know, certainly didn't initially embrace. Um, we felt that there are so many bad examples of it coming out of California and, um, kind of connecting the dots between what Lee was last talking about and our Chardonnay is that, um, I feel that so many producers are making Chardonnays that are just so one dimensionally oaky. Uh, super malolactic and you get that uh, buttered popcorn kind of rancid uh, aroma. Some people like that. Good for you if you do. Um, but I feel like it's so far away from being varietal and that's not who we are. So if we were going to make a Chardonnay, we wanted to focus on the varietal itself, keeping it varietally correct. Acidity is a huge part of the balance. Well, I believe in any wine, but most definitely only in a Chardonnay that is going to be full malolactic, which this one is, um, as well as, uh, you know, ripe, so therefore a little higher in alcohol. So what we wanted to do is is to try to take some of the um, qualities of, of Chardonnay and tone them down a little bit so the varietal could actually be expressed. You know, varietal correctness is really important to us. So um what we what we do is uh we pick we pick the grapes uh i believe pretty ripe at 23 and a half uh bricks which um usually yields us uh a, a an alcohol just around under but just around 14 percent. it's usually about 13 7 13 8 somewhere in that general ballpark and so it's not super um, alcoholic like some uh, heavily blown uh, Chardonnays are at 14.5 or 15 or whatever. And then the acidities, even though it is, um, you know, malolactic, which means we're deacidifying, is still around six grams uh, of acid, which we feel fully expresses the varietal itself. It is barrel fermented, but we don't use new barrels in this project. It's two-year-old three-year-old and four-year-old French oak barrels. And we conduct those fermentations um, in the barrels. We aggressively stir because we want to knock down the possibility of the, um, that quality that is responsible for um, kind of the buttered popcorn flavor and aroma. And uh, this gives it more of a creamy texture, which is really important to us in the profile. And it brings it together with the acidity um, kind of the reduced amount of alcohol that we have and makes it a much more balanced wine than some of the other Chardonnays on the market. And we're also very proud of the fact that this Chardonnay and the next wine you'll try from Monterey not only are grown from the same grower and they're single vineyard wines, but they're also um, well under $20 retail. So we're very proud of that. It allows us to make um, a decent amount of wine such that we can share it with our friends across the country and not have it be a limited item, which might be very, very expensive. So um, when Chris and I started the company, one of our tenants was we wanted to make we wine that we ourselves could afford. And we still feel like we're the same guys. Time's marched on. Uh, we have a little more gray hair than we used to. Um, we have families now, but our, our people, kind of who we are is still the same. Um, and that's important to us. Wine should be affordable is our belief. And although we do make some other wines that are more expensive, we make plenty of wines that are, I think, super affordable yet handmade. So um, a lot of the wines that we compete against are, you know, mega brands that they make hundreds of thousands of cases or even million, millions of cases. And, um, you know, you can make good wine at the high end, uh, high volume, but I still think that mo much more special wines come from single vineyards and made uh, with fewer hands is is a simple way to put it. Yeah, I think you hit two great points. One is obviously people are always interested in the price points here. We're at $15, $16 or so here, which is very affordable. And the competition may is probably uh, a little more mass produced, maybe not the same care, attention to detail and the same kind of looking for balance that we all want. Maybe they're just giving the people what they think they want. Um, and I think part of what you're able to do that's a little bit different is you are, have that selectivity of vineyard source. So let's talk about the vineyard source and show them the map of where, where the wine is coming from in California. Sounds terrific. Yeah, let's get over there. The vineyard is, uh, it's called Arroyo Loma. And it is, uh, well, real quick, that's my family. That's my son there who's now 14. 
and uh, he's quite a baseball slugger. We're very proud of him. And my daughter, Rosemary, is there in the pink hat. And that's uh, me, the back of my head, and my wife's uh, busy taking other pictures. But um, there are, this was a day where they were all helping out. They're very helpful uh, a lot of the times. And um, they enjoy making wine. And uh, uh, both of them have helped over the years. And it's been uh, kind of a labor of love. And my wife, most definitely uh, the keenest eye in the family, she is our designer and she puts all our packaging together does our image and our website and i think does a fabulous job uh, keeping the brand fresh and adapting to necessary changes as time goes on so thanks for uh you know uh, allowing me to speak a little bit about this picture <laughs> yeah family affair we i've got a couple of the pictures of the family there um so we'll, we'll get to see them again later um and we'll talk about maybe quickly just the different aba so help us understand where you're working and why you're working in different parts of California or how you came to work in so many different parts of California. Well, this is a great slide because it sort of addresses um, the why. <laughs> why do you guys make so many wines and why do they all come from different places? And I think the answer to that is, I mean, heck, if you go to your grocery store, I think it's well documented that, I mean, any of you who like, say, avocados, you know, they come from Colorado, Mexico, Chile, coastal places that, you know, do really, really well for, for this fruit. And um, that is so true about tomatoes or lettuces or anything else, any other food that you could imagine. Um, you know, I mean, even, even beef, you know, uh, there's, there's, there's a lot of places in the middle of the country, Texas, Oklahoma, um, even parts of the coast that um, do really well with beef, for example. There's, those are the reasons why you produce wine from specific AVAs, because certain varieties do best in certain appellations. And so what we've done over the years is we've identified certain areas that are either famous or it's well known for producing a variety. And we try to find the best growers within those appellations. And so uh, over the years, we've collected uh, a long list, a list of growers, um, actually some that aren't very good. Um, it's kind of good to know who the good growers are and who the not so good growers are because, you know, you, it kind of helps you to avoid um, some of the pitfalls there. So um, we've spent years making sure we were working with the correct people. And uh, so, we wanted to uh, uh, produce Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Frankly, it was led by Pinot Noir. I mean, I love producing Pinot, Pinot Noir. It's hard to do, but it's just a fascinating varietal. And I just think it's, uh, well, it's one of the best varieties in the world, in my opinion. But we also wanted to solidify our value proposition and to be able to produce uh, Chardonnay and a Pinot Noir for under $20 kind of forever. You know, there's a chance that maybe over time our price points will tick up but i still feel that with this sourcing we'll be able to anchor under twenty dollars and that's our goal um, if we had started in the north coast in sonoma or napa i think the wines most definitely would be uh in or above 20 pretty much out of the gate so that was really the reasoning for it our grower for the chardonnay and the pinot noir is steve mcintyre we first worked with Steve years ago. Um, he was managing a vineyard in the northern Pinnacle Mountain Range. And so it's sort of close to Gilroy. It's sort of northern interior um, Monterey. Uh, it's kind of like a little above where your uh, arrow is. Uh, and um, it's also a mountainous. It, it's really close to where the Gavilan Mountains, if anybody knows where that is. Um, a lot of Chalone wines are produced in that area. But um, we were getting a, a cool climate Viognier from them, and that was one of the key ingredients to our um, white elephant blend. And we also did a single vineyard Viognier back in the day. And finally, we also did a late harvest Gewurztraminer from that same property, which was delicious. But um, we ended up stop making it because, um, you know, the market just didn't uh, have much desire for it. But the point is, is that we... Um, we met uh, Steve and worked with Steve probably after he was, oh, you know, like an 18, 20 year vet in the industry. 
and we were kind of the punk kids coming in and, and kind of like uh, trying to make our mark. And so we developed a friendship which really um, lasted in when we, um, you know, diversified our, our line into Monterey. He was the first person that we called because, well, he's a good grower and we have had the experience of working with him. He's very professional and he grows grapes in the right location. This is a picture of Arroyo Loma looking toward the west. You see the mountain range over there, that is the Santa Lucia mountain range. And this is not a part of the um, Santa Lucia AVA, it is close. But on the other side of those mountains, you would find Big Sur, which is, uh, well, it's one of the most beautiful places in the world. If uh, if you need some items on your bucket list, that would be a good place. Uh, you just take a trip on list. Route 1, right? Yeah, I like to refer to it as where the mountains meet the ocean. Mm -hmm. It's quite beautiful there. But the point is, is that um, if you go back to that mm -hmm. slide, Lee, for a second, you can kind of see the fog up there on the mountain. And it's very typical on a coastal uh, vineyard that the cooling trend actually comes from the Pacific Ocean in California. So the fog comes over the mountains, it settles in the valley below, and it's the sun that actually burns that fog off, sometimes by 9, sometimes by 10 a.m. And sometimes, like in this Appalachian, it's not until 12 or noon, 12 o'clock, noon or 1 o'clock until that um, fog burns off. And then that's when the, the degree day starts, the heat starts building. But if you think about it, half the day's over already. So it never really gets very hot there. It's usually in the anywhere from the mid 60s to the high 70s. Certainly it's gotten up to the 90s, but that's very exceptional. That's happened uh, only a couple vintages that I can recall. And it's usually only a few days. So um, yeah, I mean, this is where, this is the same area where most of our lettuces and produce comes to feed the world. A lot of produce coming out of uh, the central coast of California. And you can imagine uh, radishes, uh, anything from Brussels sprouts to, you know, green beans to tomatoes to uh, every beautiful kind of variety of uh, lettuce you could think of. So it's all coming out of the neighbors here. In fact, some of the growers down there not only own vineyards, but they also own uh, row crop sites where they are growing uh, vegetables um, for, for the world which is kind of fascinating. Yeah, uh, this coastal influence is something we've talked a lot about, um, certainly with uh, both South American and uh, California and, and, and uh, uh, Pacific influence sites, um, this fog that comes in and burning off, um, whether it's Santa Barbara or here at Monterey or Sonoma, or we were talking about Chile, having coastal Chile. Absolutely. And Yes, humble current. So a familiar story for those people that have tuned in previously. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, uh, Chile is like so coastal. It's crazy. It's almost like a, a, a narrower version of California. It sure on, is. You know, not on the other side of the hemisphere. But um, it, you know, I thought I was in California when I was there. It's quite amazing. Yeah, I had that same exact feeling when I first time I saw Chile was, oh my goodness, this looks like California. <laughs> it does. Wow. It really does. And you have the same flora and fauna down there too, so uh, it's it's interesting. But yeah, uh, I still think the people are nicer there, though. <laughs> <laughs> Let's taste a little Pinot Noir and see what we're getting out of this cool climate Pinot Noir. Awesome, here. awesome, great. So that's this guy. Um, a lot of people have asked us why why we didn't put a capsule on this, and the reason there's a couple reasons for it. Um, one is that you know, we, we sell uh, our wine uh, to restaurants, certainly. And uh, God bless them, they'll open soon, hopefully. Um, but we, uh, we had screw caps uh, being utilized as a closure before. And so we thought that, well, you know, you can imagine, I mean, imagine being a guest in a restaurant and you're sitting at a table, maybe it's a white tablecloth restaurant, and the server comes up and he or she opens the bottle and you know there's that weird sort of uh yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna remove this screw cap for you ma'am or sir <laughs> and what do you do with it it's just a little bit embarrassing and we used to think that well at our price points our wines should be sold by the glass and therefore they should be behind the bar and um, the reality is, is that because of our wines over delivering on quality, 
um, that we really should not limit the possibility that we could serve these wines on a wine list and somebody would serve it at a, a table and pull a, a corkscrew out and open the wine. Um, the happy medium was, uh, if you could imagine, we were able to pour this wine by the glass in a very, very busy restaurant. Um, screw caps are easy. When you get an order, all you do is you just twist it off and pour, which is fantastic um, for a busy bartender. But at least if we were able to remove the capsule, there's one less step for that person to get set up. Or if they're really busy and a wine bottle isn't open, they could just go right in with their corkscrew. So that was the reasoning behind that. Uh, frankly, I actually, it's a fat neck burgundy bottle. So I think it looks cool. And then we put the vintage on there, which I think is kind of a classy little touch. So okay, other sure brands are doing it. Say again. If they didn't believe any of that, you can tell them it's more sustainable. Yeah, well, it is. It's not this uh, uh, metal that you got to throw away or, or some of the capsules have uh, plastics in them as well. And so it's just another unnecessary piece of junk that, that one has to remove and it's somewhat unnecessary. And we're also very proud of our corks. So those corks are, um, they're coming from uh, Amarum and what they do is, uh, the, I, I guess you could refer to them as particle corks. So. The cork itself is cork, it's real cork, but what they do is they break it down into little almost sand-like particles and it gives them the opportunity to irradiate them and treat them so that there's no potential for the organism that will cause TCA. Um, it's off-putting aroma um, that combines with chlorine. You can imagine, you know, we, we use water in, in, in the winery and there's chlorine in water and so any very minute particles of chlorine can combine with the organism that you know you find in the spoilage of 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 some cork bark and so when they react you get this musty character which you know we always worry that if somebody doesn't know what a cork bottle was they'll just think that you know our wine is good that and that's not what we want so there's a hundred percent guarantee against tca with these corks and we're very proud of that and uh you know why not uh let them be naked so everybody can see them. So I guess well, that, those is, were a couple of reasons. It's pure and clean, 100% Pinot Noir. We're not fooling around. We're trying to make something bigger and bolder and badder than Pinot Noir is supposed to be. Yeah, you know, the goal is not to hit people over the head with a sledgehammer. It's to really underscore the varietal correctness of, of Pinot Noir. And in order for us to achieve that, we uh, we use three different cl clones, which are my favorite. Um, I think I like them individually, but the sum of the parts is always the best. So we use um, six six seven, which is a very um, aromatic and floral. It really um, grasps the kind of you know ripe cherry and generosity and a little bit of that perfume that is so uh, you know typical of of good Pinot Noirs. And then we use Pumar 4, which is very textural and it has a lot of earthy characters to it and it's really hard to grow. Um, and finally, 115, uh, which I guess pound for pound is my favorite because it really um, has a lot of the same characteristics as the other two. Um, it, it has a lot of the beautiful top notes, the quintessential perfume, it has nice grip and some of that earthy character um, that is known in uh, Pumard 4. So what we do, because they're different clones, and I like to explain clones sort of like cousins, right? So they're genetically similar. They're the same variety, sort of, if you compare it to family, or same family name, right? But they're actually slightly different genetically. And so that speaks to the character of each of those. And so it's important, I think, um, when you're making a complex Pinot Noir that you really need to use um, certainly more than one clone. I think that's um, a, a good idea. Um, we, we, because they're different clones, they ripen at different times. And when they ripen at different times, um, we of course have to make the wines uh, separately. But after each of these is completed with fermentation, we actually blend them all together and we put them through malolactic in barrel. And what that does is it really um, kind of solidifies the flavors. Um, it uh, 
creates a little bit of a silky uh, texture to it because it's conducting its secondary fermentation in the presence of oak. And I think that gives us a head start on aging and it gives us um, an added uh, textural benefit which carries through to the finished product after being aged in barrel for 14 months. Yeah, we've got, um, what vintage? We have 17 here, I believe. That's yes, 17 vintage. Yes. Um, and what kind of food pairings you like with these guys? People always like to know that kind of thing. Well, I guess we'll, we'll just go start from where we were and go back. Um, uh, I feel like uh, with Pinot Noir, anything kind of goat cheese works really well. Um, a friend of mine makes a goat cheese tart. And on the crust lining, he actually uses sun-dried tomato paste, which he makes. And just the, the acidity that comes from the sun-dried tomatoes, and then just that nice kind of soft matrix of, um, of goat cheese really melds really well and blends nicely with the flavor of the Pinot Noir. And so that would be kind of my go-to. So if you're up for making a goat cheese uh, pie, make sure you use... Uh, a little bit of the sun-dried tomato paste right up at the shell. And then um, yeah, I serve it not hot, but just sort of more warm. And then just a really nice, simple salad with it right on the same plate. And it's just perfect. I love it. Um, classic combinations with Pinot Noir involve duck. If you eat meat, um, duck breast is fantastic. It, it works really, really well with that. Um, I've, I've even found, uh, you know, although cassoulet is sort of like typical for uh, Syrah, I find that um, a, a good backboned uh, Pinot Noir actually works really well with cassoulet, which, you know, has um, duck in it as well. Uh, a lot of times they have uh, sausage and certainly white beans and other things. So um, that's always nice. They're kind of colder climate, kind of colder, you know, winter time things to eat with it. Um, I like, I like Pinot Noir on its own, frankly, I just, you know, it's a very contemplative variety. Um, it's very uh, pleasing in that way. Good ones can be. And so, and going to the Chardonnay, um, certainly would go well with uh, goat cheese as well. But, uh, I like, um, I like to match it up with, uh, other things that, um, you know, vegetables that you're going to use, uh, maybe some butter with when you're, uh, cooking. Uh, because it really kind of blends nicely with the malolactic that comes from the Chardonnay. It's a natural with um, lobster for that reason, you know, especially if you're using drawn butter. Um, here's a real easy one. Um, microwave popcorn works really well <laughs> with Chardonnay, uh, as does um, pretzels um, because of the salt. So um, anyway, anything off the grill, you know, like a, a grilled salmon or... You could even do um, like a uh, like a sea bass that's uh, steamed with a miso broth and uh, uh, ginger or something like that. That works pretty well too. So. You are making me hungry there. <laughs> but, uh, we have one more wine to taste here, and we're going to go a little further south, and we'll let you introduce um, the Insider Cabernet. Yeah. So here's the Insider, and uh, we've been producing the Insider for since the 2012 vintage. This is the 2017. And um, again, the reason why we make this wine, why we went to the Central Coast, is because Paso Robles is very well known for Cabernet Sauvignon. There are now a few um, producers that, um, that are, are very famous for producing the variety. And so on our quest to find the best possible grower, the best site for these varieties. We actually um, came into a an estate a winery that actually does also sell their grapes because they, they grow more grapes than they actually bottle themselves. And so what was interesting about that is that, you know, we're getting the same quality grapes that they put into their bottle. We certainly make the wine on our own. We pick the grapes up at their location and take them to ours but the finished product of what we make is remarkably similar to the product that they make when you buy grapes from this organization you have to sign an nda and you can't tell anybody where the grapes came from which is frustrating for us because we really like to tell everybody where everything comes from but it did give us a name the insider so we consider ourselves insiders in that we were able to discover 
this opportunity and um we'd love to be able to tell you where the grapes are from but uh that would mean that we wouldn't be able to work with them anymore and so um we sort of keep that discreet and um that's the reason why but it's fantastic wine uh it's coming from four different vineyards in different um regions within the Paso Robles AVA they now have 11 sub AVAs and um so you know we're getting them out of uh Adelaida Creston um Santa Ma Santa Margarita Ranch and Templeton right Templeton Gap so those four there are state vineyards that are coming out of somebody else's program and um so they're using those different areas for their um program and we're basically getting part of it as well and so um again similar to the pinot noir we uh with pinot we're using three different clones in this case we're getting grapes from four different vineyards so naturally each of these vineyards ripens at a different time and so we pick them uh when each of them is ready we do the fermentation separately and as fermentation completes, we end up pressing and uh, putting all the uh, lots together. And uh, after that, we put them in two-year-old uh, French oak barrels and age them for 18 months. And we rack, we rack them five times. So what that means is, is we put wine into a barrel. And in the early stages of a wine, it's, we would refer to it as being dirty. Um, it has a lot of particles from fermentation and over time they settle to the bottom and so we do a racking which is we literally take a a wand or it's like a little pipe that is connected to a hose that's then connected to a pump and at the other end of the pump is a tank and so we'll suck the the clean or the bright wine off of the bottom of the bear you know off the top so that we leave kind of the sludge at the bottom of the barrel and that's called racking so we're taking clean wine off of dirty wine leaving the dirty wine behind we then you know dump those barrels clean them out take the clean wine that we just put into uh the tank and return it to the barrel that's called racking so we do that five times four times throughout the life of the wine and then one more time for bottling and the resulting wine that we get has a, for me, a very, <coughs> a me. very um, uh, Paso flavor profile, which tends to be different than Cabernet from other parts of California. Um, why don't you talk a little bit about what you think the general characteristics of uh, Paso Robles Cab is and how it compares to maybe what people are familiar with, more North Coasty kind of stuff? Well, I think that... Um Paso Rebels uh, Cabernet is generally, uh, it's almost more fruit driven. And um, the, the, the varietal itself is certainly Cabernet varietal, but it generally ends up not being as tannic as some of the North Coast wines can be. Um, the reason why I like that is because it makes the wines in general uh, more balanced and ready to pair with food and to tackle from a flavor profile at an earlier age. A lot of Napa Valley Cabernets um, are aged in barrels. Ours, we make one. It's aged for 26 months in barrels and then another six months in the bottle. So it's practically three years before we even release the wine. And then people are drinking it, you know, they're sitting on it and, you know, holding it for another couple, three, five, seven years. And so um, what's great about Paso Robles is that you can certainly um, produce a, a really good quality Cabernet at an affordable price, and you can hit a lot of the sensibilities. Um, I think that if we were to crop it less and, and, and have a, you know, I think our tonnage is about four and a half tons to the acre is what we generally get with, this, with these vineyards. Um, and our Napa is anywhere from, say, in some vineyards, some years it's been one, but usually it's two to three tons to the acre. Okay, so there's a little bit of a concentration difference. But if we had a vineyard in Paso Robles that we cropped to two or three tons to the acre, the concentration would also go up. 
but so would the price. <laughs> so what's really important to me is that we have um, sort of the best of both worlds. We, we get a really excellent quality Cabernet wine. This one scored a 90. Um, so that puts it on the map in terms of quality Cabernets in the marketplace. Uh, we get to produce a little bit more and we're charging our friends under $20 for it, which I think is what everyone likes. Um, so I would consider this sort of a medium plus bodied Cabernet as opposed to a heavy tannic uh, Cabernet from the North Coast. It makes it versatile. It's a great by the glass wine for restaurants. And I think it's a very enjoyable wine for everyone else uh, within a budget, which is fantastic. Yeah, it's it's palate friendly as well as pocket friendly. Exactly. Yes. And also for me, just a, my typical take on wine, cab from the region is it tends to be, I totally agree with you about concentration and kind of weight. I also get more of a red fruit profile than a lot of the black yeah. sometimes. So uh, Absolutely. I agree with that. I, I think that's... Uh, that's akin to uh, to Paso Robles. That that is a typical trait. Um, I think that you you know you could take any variety and grow it in a different location, and you'll get a different result. So um, I think that uh, um, it's a bit of a different animal. It's probably a little bit like comparing Oregon Pinot Noir to California Pinot Noir. They're both good. They just have different profiles to them. And, For sure. Uh, you know, so, so yeah, I think that's, that's an important characteristic to note there. Um, yeah. Um, I think we've, we're kind of uh, moved into our 45 minute arena here. Um, I've been monitoring a lot of our friends. So if they have any uh, questions, feel free to type it in. Um, I've been getting a lot of um, positive comments that are agreeing with you. Must get, uh, must get the wines, goat cheese soon, duck too. So. <laughs> Good. That's great. So, some stuff. Uh, our friend, Mr. Stover, who uh, goes back with you how many years is a oh, lovely, lovely profile picture, Stover. Um, <laughs> he's loving the insider. <laughs> yeah, he's not driving in that picture, is he? <laughs> uh, he's in the back seat. He's in the back seat. <laughs> he's in the back seat. Oh, that yeah. makes it okay. <laughs> <laughs> so we've got uh, some other folks, a few people from Texas, and then uh, we have some people on the Outer Banks joining us from North Carolina. Um, as Fantastic. well as uh, some friends, I think you were with uh, Jefferson's, uh, not Absolutely. that long ago. Yeah, that was yeah, fun. So, really so, good uh, say hi out there and uh, some other comments that uh, articulate but easy to grasp explanations from Richard. Yeah, um, that's how I roll. <laughs> well, I was gonna. I was gonna compliment you on your um, very technical description of uh, sediment at sludge. That's uh, you know that's that's what they taught you at UC Davis, right? <laughs> well, behind um, they they taught us a lot of theory, but I think what they taught us was how to think, and that was important. Um, my professor once uh, we have these uh, um, uh, hoses in the winery that. Uh, the brand is called Strauman, and they're pretty heavy-duty nozzles. And the first time you use them, they're a little confusing because you're not sure which is the business end. <laughs> so <laughs> to give you an idea of how, you know, sort of maybe more book smart some of my professors are and a little less hands-on, uh, my professor once just nailed me right in the face with one of those when he picked it up to spray something off in his hands. So that was fun. <laughs> And yeah. I didn't even, I wasn't even wearing my goggles. I didn't need those then. So, um, yeah, it got me right in the eye. So Roger Bolton, thanks. That was a real <laughs> wake up call for me. There's a shout out. A shout it out. was, it was. Um, so I had great fun. Um, hopefully I represented you properly. Um, oh, I'm sure you did. It, it was great. I was enjoying uh, listening to you while I was waiting to jump in. So uh, any last minute thoughts? I mean, we're, we've talked about the Insider. Maybe we should mention that uh, we'll be launching Insider Chardonnay and Insider Pinot um, not too far in the future. It's come down the pike uh, soon, hopefully, near you. Yeah. And so those are, uh, we're, we're doing a line extension on the Insider. It's been a lot of fun. It's been well received. Um, it's a fun brand. Um, every time I talk about it, people are always trying to guess, well, where's I think I know the winery and it's just kind of a fun thing, playful thing to, to do, a playful way to sell the wine. And um, 
So the uh, the other two varieties are we are making a Chardonnay, which is coming out of um, the Carneros region. And Carneros is the only AVA um, in California that is shared between two counties. So Carneros goes into both Sonoma and Napa. So um, I always wanted to produce a wine that was from that AVA for that kind of Sybil reason, if you know what I mean. Um, kind of Napa Sonoma, maybe both. I don't know. Mystery, <laughs> you know. And then the other one is our Pinot Noir, which is from the Sonoma Coast. And um, it's the real Sonoma Coast. I mean, this is really good fruit. It's um, really, it's a part of uh, what is known as the Petaluma Gap uh, AVA, uh, but it is a part of the Sonoma Coast. It's the newest AVA in uh, Sonoma County. And um, it is coming out of a very premium um, uh estate winery same kind of concept as the cabernet and so you know of course we had to sign an nda to buy the grapes but um super super high quality you know with all these wines we'll stand them next to the the said uh producer and the quality is going to be the same uh but the price will be maybe 50 percent <laughs> of what yeah. theirs is so, so we're, we're very proud of that and you know to us it's a little bit of like a seek and find you know we're looking for the opportunities and it makes us excited because we actually get to make the wine and then we end up putting in to the bottle something that we feel is really special that we're hoping um, people will discover and realize that wow we're getting you know a handmade wine by a couple guys you know and uh, for a price that's really just a lot less than what the alternatives be from other producers so we're very proud of that sub twenty dollars on those two insiders so uh, keep an eye out for those locally and uh, ask your favorite wine sellers person whether it's uh, jim stover he still wants to know if he can get more of the 2017 insider which <laughs> yes, you can check your yes. inventory report yes you can. <laughs> <laughs> well, I want to thank you, Richard, um, for joining us today. Sorry for rushing you around in a rainstorm trying to get around and doing your job out there, which is to make great wine. In the meantime, we enjoyed some of your wine and learned a little bit about you and your kind of really unique start and what you're doing out there. And it must be fun to be able to dabble in all these different uh, American viticultural areas and it make is. great wine for yeah. people. Um, we're pretty open company. Um, if you had some questions that weren't answered here and you wanted to contact us, you could do so through our website, venomsellers.com. And my email is just richard at venomsellers.com. So if you forget my name or what my email is, just go to our website and I think it's on there somewhere. I'm pretty sure. So yeah. love to answer your questions if you have any. Hey, that's great, Richard. Thanks again for joining us today. And um, I just want to let everybody know that we'll be back on Saturday for Wine Cellars Wine Weekend. We're going to take a trip to Rioja in Spain and visit with one of our suppliers there, Carlos Serres, and we'll drink some Tempranillo for sure. And uh, again, Richard, thank you for joining us on today's Wine Wednesday on our hump day. May we make it to the weekend <laughs> and uh, you have a good evening out there in California. Thank you. Thanks for having me. Appreciate All right, everybody stay safe and enjoy some venom. All right, take care. Bye.